Good evening and welcome to November 2nd, 2020 Ordinance Review Committee. Committee. As usual, this meeting and all who participate in it with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. Laura, can we do a roll call, please? Sure. Um, Councillor Labarge. Councillor Labarge? Here. Okay. Uh, Councillor Nash? Here. Councillor Thorpe? Here. Member Peck? Here. And Member Napolitano? Here. Thank you. Uh, now to public comment. We will begin with public comment. If you know you wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature. To raise your hand, you click on participants in the horizontal menu bar at the bottom of the screen. A column, column will open with the participants of the meeting. The raise hand feature is at the bottom of the column. If you are calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you're having trouble raising your hand, you may use the chat feature to send a message to me. I will do my best to monitor that for people having technical difficulties, but that is only for the purpose for which we will use that function and it will only be used during public comment. I will unmute each raised hand one by one and ask if you would like to make a comment. When you begin, please state your name and your city or town for public record. We do not respond during public comment as it is your time to speak. So while your comment should be directed to us, you will understand when we don't respond. Due to the size of the meeting that it is public and how remote participation works, all participants will need to be muted until called upon. I also ask that all of you but the community members turn off your video until called upon as comments are directed to the committee members and only the person recognized has the floor. We will do our best to act quickly if someone is clearly acting in a way that is inappropriate, deploying for profanity or slurs, and we will remove anyone that needs to be removed. I will remind people that we're always happy to receive comments by email, which are equally part of the public record. So please email us at citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. Okay, doesn't look like anyone in public comments, Laura. Do I, am I missing something? Nope. Can't hear you, Laura. Thank you. No, I don't see anybody. Okay. Anyone, anyone? No public comments, so we're moving on to the approval of the minutes of October 19, 2020. Do I hear a motion for, I hear a motion to approve by Council Barge. Second. Seconded by Jeff Napolitano. Hi. Oh, Megan. Sir, I actually have, um, I, I usually want to suggest a few minor additions. Clarity, maybe just for myself, but, um, I think page five here, the next to the last. Mm -hmm. Ms. Pike voice her understanding that the second bucket, can we add, is both solicited and unsolicited specific recommendations. Okay, I'm just, let me find that one. Uh, there you go. It makes more sense to me. I, maybe one, just two, three, page five. Very much. So you, are you just adding the word both before solicited and unsolicited? Both solicited and solicited specific recommendations. Specific and the word specific. Okay, got it. I'll make that change. We need to change the last page, the meeting schedule, the next meeting. It says next meeting is October 28th, 2020, and we Maybe we decide that at the meeting and then we changed it afterwards, didn't we? Oh, right. Yeah, that's what we actually said. I can, I, you know what? I could put a note there saying the meeting was subsequently rescheduled to 11 2. About. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we need a motion to approve those changes, correct? Make a motion I I... to approve the changes. Thank you. Motion made by Councillor Barge, seconded by. I had Jeff Napolitano. Thank you. Seconding Thank you. it earlier, yeah. but. Okay. Roll call, Laura, for approval sure. and the amended changes. Um, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. Okay. Motion of uh, approval of the minutes have been approved with those changes. Moving on to now the suggested ordinance changes not yet referred to city solicitor. I'll make a motion. 
Second that. Motion made by Councillor Nash, seconded by Councillor Labard. Yes. Thank you. Is this a motion to refer them as a group or is that for the first? Does anyone have any well, suggestions? I'll say my motion was for the first one. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought too. <laughs> yes. Um, do we want to combine all of them for referral or do them separately? Councilor Nash? I think we need to do them separately because Thank they, you. as I reviewed them, they seem to be going, you know, different places so okay. do we want to talk about each place as we go through each one sure thank you okay so the first one is mr zimnox requested changes we already had the motion for the first one made by councillor nash and seconded by councillor barge yes so um <laughs> I, I lost my agenda for a minute because of all of the Zoom stuff. But um, the, so what Mr. Zimnock is pointing out is a discrepancy between um, it in, in terms of lane widths in relation to parking. And um, under the regulations, it's saying that the lane needs to be 12 feet, but under the fine, the fine occurs at 15 feet. And so lane width is usually, that would be the jurisdiction of the DPW, but the parking fine would kind of be more in the area of our parking department. And so, and I, I'm, I think I can ask for um, Attorney Seawald's help here because um, I almost think that, that it's the mayor's office would be the person to kind of, to tease out which was what's going on here, whether it was, you know, just a typo on either the 12 or the 15. I, I, I think that's probably what happened here, uh, but that, um, that it would be more the mayor's to, office to figure out, to sort out which was which here. So, and, and council and, and attorney Seawald would, if we referred it to you, would you be the one who would figure that out? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the the use of, of public ways is one of the, uh, some would say, few things that are uh, in the jurisdiction of the city council. So this wouldn't be uh, the mayor's sold call or the DPW's sold call. Uh, okay. They would, would enforce whatever the rule is. But if there's an inconsistency, it ought to be uh, rectified. Yeah. So who do you, so the, I guess the question then is who do we ask for the, um, or their, to weigh in and, and give us a determination as to which it should yep. be? I'm thinking it's probably 12 feet because that um, tends to be travel lane. One AirPod yesterday. I'm getting in um, interference here. Oh, I left uh, my name and number in case the rest of it showed up. Hey, at Patrick. Patrick. Patrick, mute yourself. Can somebody mute Patrick, please? Oh, whoops. Thank you. Oh, so anyway, I, my point is, Please. as far as travel lanes, that determining what that width should that be. Would, DPW. Right. You should get input from DPW, but ultimately you're going to make a recommendation and the city council is going to decide which one's which. Okay, so we should get a recommend. So we should ask for a recommendation from DPW. If you want to solve the problem, I think you would ask for a recommendation from DPW. <laughs> yes, I want to solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so then my motion would be to ask DPW to recommend a solution to this to. Um, so we can make a referral to city council for the discrepancies, discrepancy. discrepancy. God, that was a lot of words. You're talking about the discrepancies under the ones dealing with the vehicles and traffic. The, yeah, the, right. there's two. Right, there's two. There's two of them uh, that Mr. Zimnock has on the grid there. The first 
the first two. One is right. 12 feet, and the second one's the 15. Okay. So motion was made by you and seconded by Council of Barge. Yes. Okay. Yes. And on the other three? Well, I think what we want to do is maybe just vote on this one, get that one out of the way, and then we go to the others. Okay, thank you, Councillor Nash. Lorik, never roll call? Lorik. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Uh, Member Peck? Yes. And Member Napolitano? Yes. Okay. That has been referred to DPW. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. The uh, it seems like if we're going to go through these now, we can do the same thing with every one of them, because you know you might want to send the historical commission to to the planning office who administers you know you know that that commission. Uh, is that is that is that the plan? I thought the plan was to see what was being referred to me to go through first blush. I'm happy to t touch bases with the DPW and ask them which is which is the right number. Um, I'm happy to do that in my review. I'm happy to talk to Wayne about uh, you know any issues with the historical commission okay. uh, and and these ordinances rather than it being like a cumbersome process for you. I can come back and report to you what they've said uh, about about these. That would be simpler. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yes. And that, in, in this way, you don't have to go through every one of these proposed changes and decide who you want to speak to. I can tell you who I've spoken to, and if and if and if I didn't speak to the right person or or enough uh, city uh, agency department heads, then we can you know we can do that after. But I think I can streamline this for you. Thank you, Attorney Seawold. Greatly appreciated. Okay. So, a point of order, uh, which question. So, what do we do with that vote we just did, Attorney Seawold? <laughs> How do we undo that? So, we're just giving you the package. Jim, I just wanted to send the packet to him and let him. Uh... I know, I screwed up. All right. But no, it's... no. It's... <laughs> no one screws up here. We're, we're, we're all, you know. That's okay. <laughs> it's all good. So, I, let's go back. Oh, I think attorney Seawald is muted. I think he's speaking. <laughs> wait, right. wait, wait. I was oh. a motion to vacate your earlier motion. And, uh, and, and then you, and then Laura will be relieved of that obligation. All right. I'd like to make a motion to vacate my earlier motion. I'll second that. Motion made by Councillor Mash. Nash, seconded by Councilor Barge. Let's get back to the drawing board here on the suggested ordinance changes. So the ones for Mr. Zimnock requested changes. Laura, sitting there, grin, you're gritting your teeth. So Do we still need a, a roll call on the motion oh, to vacate. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You could just you could just chime in at any time, you know. So I wasn't sure. Uh, Councilor the Barge. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And member Napolitano. Yes. Okay. Motion vacated. Now. I'm going to take all three of these and combine them or we're going to refer them to attorney Seawald. Correct. Thank you. So on the Mr. Zimnock's requested changes, the miscellaneous changes already discussed in the commercial buffer zone proposal. Do I hear a motion I make to a forward motion. those to Attorney Seawald? Make that motion to forward it to Attorney Seawald. Motion made by Councilor Barge. Second. Seconded by Councilor Nash. Laura, can I have a roll call, please? Sure. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Um, I apologize. I'm, I, I didn't hear the last, I didn't hear the last minute. What are we voting on? 
we are sending the ordinances A, B, and C. We're referring those to Attorney Seawald. Okay, I'm, not, I'm looking at the wrong page. Then these are these are not Zimnox. Um, no, nope, Mr. Zimnox has one page. There's miscellaneous changes already discussed, which is Part B. We're combining them. Um, I have actually. I would like to. I have a couple of things I would like to discuss on that. Which one? The uh, miscellaneous changes, please. Okay. So, is it all right if we halt the vote and discuss yep. this? We will vacate the prior motion. I don't think we called that to a vote, did we? Didn't no, we, we just didn't. the motions on the floor? So this motion, yep. Okay. So it's so, open for discussion. Right. Okay. Member Peg, Vice Chair. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> so the chapter one sixteen alarms. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're looking at that one. Um, I, I'd like to posit that that ordinance be moved into the second category because of its implications for marginalized populations if they're enforced. I feel like it's it merits a discussion by us because the activity is tied to um, regressive fees and potentially impacts low income renters possibly both in private and public housing. And I did a um, search on the codes. Um, there are a couple of related codes. If you look at false alarms. Um, so currently, I don't know. I, I don't know if there is a, a norm and then someone picked out the, the inconsistency. Um, I don't know, just like historically, has a city been only penalizing people after the third false alarm, or they have just been fining for each successive alarm, false ex, each successive false alarm, excuse me. Um, but I think that that is worthy of our discussion as a commission. Um, and also there are the, the related ordinances, um, kind of jumped out at me. Um, it says the fire services, um, have, after fire services have recorded three separate false alarms within any 12 month period from alarm, fire, from alarm system, the fire chief shall notify the alarm user by certified mail of such fact and require said user to submit within 15 days after receipt of such notification, uh, indicating that the problem has been identified and corrected. And if the fire chief records four or more false alarms in any 12 month period related to the fire alarm system failure, the fire chief may order the replacement of system or component as necessary to prevent the occurrence of false alarms. And I just, I can imagine that being fairly difficult for, for a lot of people to um, respond to. Um, but we did, we did um, in the last meeting, I thought decide that we should get a closer to look at anything that required, that had a find attached to it. Um, anything that was fee, uh, and activities that were fee-based. So this just happens to be something that I, I think isn't, is, Mirrors a more substantive discussion. Any other members? Uh, okay, uh, Attorney Seawald. I, I had intended that I would just be reviewing this, uh, this inconsistency and confirming, yes, this is an inconsistency. My review doesn't in any way limit your discussion of any other implications that the ordinance may have. So my intention was to go through this and, you know, find out whether it's 12 or 15 feet that the DPW intended, uh, confirm that, yes, there is this discrepancy. And then you can bring it back into your third category and decide, well, this is something we also have to look at for its impact on, on um, you know, 
traditionally marginalized communities. Uh, that's, uh, you, know, you know, again, but I would just caution that if, if you're gonna do zoning and you're gonna do all fines, you're gonna be running into a lot of time crunches here. So um, I, I'm just, you know, it's November. And if you don't get an extension, it's November. And uh, I'm just saying that be thoughtful about what you decide you want to, you know, bite off right in, in this particular setting. That's all. Any other members? Jeff? Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, well, first of all, I think that if the process is that Attorney Seymour is going to basically vet them for accuracy and, uh, you know, what's the best practice and so forth, um, as intended by like the Department of Public Works or whatever, and then it's brought back and then we, if the process is that we then have basically a, a list of things that are going to go into our recommendations one way or the other that we then, you know, at, at that point, then I'm fine with waiting until that point to vet it. Um, but I think that, that um, um, Member Peck brings up a very good point. I, I, the, I, there's a just a, a thing that um, occurs to me, um, uh, anecdote about how somebody was talking about how, oh, you know, um, I just park anywhere. There were these people who were having this conversation. Oh, I just park anywhere on the street. Uh, it's not a big deal. And they were like, well, don't you get a ticket? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, but it's a $50 ticket. And this person had lots and lots of money and um, like things like fines and like speeding tickets and those sort of things like had no real effect upon them because they just saw them as like this little thing that they have to pay. Whereas for other people, it's an entirely different story. I know people who uh, struggle with every parking ticket that they get in Northampton. Um, and so I just think that that discrepancy is the thing that we probably want to at least have a conversation about before we make any recommendations to the city council right yep. so um <clears throat> megan and then council labarge yes um i am going to follow the path that our city solicitor is telling us what we should be doing here mm -hmm. and i think he's absolutely correct i think we need to look at how we're approaching in the time involvement, even if we have an extension here. So I'm here as a city councilor, working along with our city solicitor in our commission here. So I'm very comfortable working with our city solicitor on guiding us in the direction we should be going in. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Labarge. Megan? Okay, I think the timing and the process was, was unclear. Um, to me, definitely. Um, and I simply, you know, I'm fine with forwarding all of these a mess to Attorney Seawall for now, as long as specific ordinances like these are flagged for further discussion down the road. And I certainly don't, I think we have to be cautious not to limit ourselves to by the, by the, calendar to um, very specific groups of ordinances like zoning. Um, I, I think there are many other, and we're housing, there are a number of other volunteer boards who are actually have quite a bit of overlap <laughs> um, with us and I, I think we were formed you know, for with a pretty specific purpose. And I do think that we should at least try to cover or represent um, a, a good number of uh, the number of categories that we've previously discussed. Um, Councilor Labarge. Yes, um, I just wanna say, and I'm gonna echo it again that we are four months behind. And it's too bad that we didn't start four months ago because we really could be covering a tremendous amount of work. So that's what I want to say. Jim Nash. Uh, Councilor Nash. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we devised that bucket system last time so we could 
really expedite certain things, but that if we, you know, if, if along the way we're seeing stuff that we want to discuss further, I, I think in, in this case, um, uh, particularly looking at parking fees and things like that, I, I think that would be a, a great thing to put on the agenda for, for our next meetings. We could really go into this in more detail. Mm -hmm. I actually spent an hour on the phone with Nas Nancy Forrestal last week and got a lot of really interesting uh, information. And um, but anyway, I don't. But and I'm. Uh, but I, I I agree with Megan. You know that um, with Member Peck that we should, you know, put it put it on our next agenda so we can discuss it in more detail. Thank you. <laughs> any other members? Megan, anything else? Um, no, I'm fine. Just um, if yep. we could just note that certain ordinances to be flagged um, for a future discussion, I'm fine. Okay. For any new on. Okay. Okay, so with that said, Laura, can we get a roll call, please, on these ordinance A, B, and C moving forward? Councillor Labarge. I, I didn't hear what Councillor Thorpe just said. Roll call, Councillor Labarge, for us to move these ordinances to Attorney Seawald. Okay, thank you so much. Yep. Nope, not a problem. Councillor yes. Labarge, yes. yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Member Peck? Yes. And member Napolitano. Yes. Okay. On now to the review of zoning ordinances. We're going to have a discussion of current zoning initiatives intended to remove barriers to fair housing. And with us is Wayne Fiden, the Director of Planning and Sustainability. Thank you, Mr. Fiden, for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me. Is it okay if I share my screen and show you my slides? Yes. Um, so, and I'm going to, I'm taking my charge a little liberally and so I'm talking about some things that aren't zoning as well, just to um, talk about sort of how, how these things all fit together. For, for, um, so just, you know, quickly, this is, I'm sure you've all seen this for years. This is my office's logo. Um, I just want to emphasize how we always think that equity is a key part how it has to be not sort of a separate box, how everything has to fit together. Um, so equity isn't like, here's equity and here's environment and here's um, the economy, but they all have to merge together. And so the things I'm gonna go talk about trying to sort of fit in this, this that framework. Um, I'm sure you've all seen, this, this is not our creative to us, we stole this from the internet. I'm sure you've all seen this 50 different versions out here, but just so we're on the same page, you know, so, by equity, we're not talking about equality. We're talking about how do we serve the needs for, for each group, not treating everybody exactly the same. Um, not everyone's, you know, this is um, not universally accepted, but this is certainly our, our approach for, for doing this process. And then again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in the intro, but sorry. Um, but just so we're on the same page, the way we, and we were not the ones who created this by any means, but just so you know, from a definitional standpoint, the way we define equity is these five boxes and it's really important because everybody usually agrees on the distributional part of equity which is the goodies right in, in my world it's who gets the windfalls from government action and who gets the wipeouts from government action so who gets the goodies but equal important these other aspects right so I, going around who is a seat at the table um you know I, are we dealing with deep structural issues um, institutional racism for years and sort of, you know, long-term inequities. The intergenerational, who's paying, right? So every time city council borrows money, we talk about what are we building today and paying for tomorrow? What's the balance? Obviously it's true as in primary areas. Um, and then the cultural values, right? So we all sort of take our own values for granted and don't necessarily think about what are other cultures values and that's going to show up. So. Uh, as we go through my slide, just sort of keep that as, as a quick framework that, that we think about in this space. Um, and, and so I'm not spending time because this is, you're really here for ordinances, but um, it's part of the framework for every major plan that we do. 
So whether it's, you know, we have an open space plan, which you don't think of as being a big equity piece, but part of our open space framework is having open space within 10 minutes walk of uh, neighborhoods and when we're buying land, creating some um, affordable housing lots to balance so we're not making the price of housing more expensive. So I'm not gonna go through each of these things, but each of the major documents we're talking, we're working on, the most recent is our resilience hub working on right now, all we think have a strong equity framework. Um, that's an important part of, of what we do with them. So again, it's integrating into the mix. Um, so everything else I'm talking about, the next whatever I have, three or four or five slides, are, are specific regulatory changes, zoning and others, some that are very far along and some that are earlier in the process. So the first one is to be an, an ordinance going to city council proposing allowing two family homes by right in every residential neighborhood in the city. Um, we're already far ahead of most small cities in the country. So in urban residential B and urban residential C are our two densest zoning districts. Urban residential C is for the donut around downtown. Urban residential B is the next donut around downtown and it's the donut around Florence. Right? So basically the areas in walking distance of downtown or Florence are zoned urban residential B or C. Those areas house 60% of our population. Those areas already allow two family housing by right. Those areas include some of the most expensive neighbors in the city. So we know that two family housing does not damage property values because the most expensive homes are, are in these dense neighborhoods. But even though it represents 60% of our population, it represents a small minority of the, the land mass. Maybe not a small minority, but it represents a minority of the land mass. So our other zoning districts, again, that you have to know what they are, urban residential A, suburban residential, rural residential, water supply protection, our other districts are all single family home only. Um, in some cases, if you're a developer buying a large parcel of land, you can do what's called cluster development, where you preserve most of the property's open space, can crowd more housing on a part of the property, and then you can have multifamily. Um, so we do allow multifamily in every district in that sense, but not generally if you just on a lot. So the idea of this zoning is basically to build on the experience downtown that it works and create two families. Some of these two families will be really high end, right? There's no guarantee that two families are affordable. That's not our goal. Our goal is to have a range of housing types, but some are gonna be affordable. On average, two family homes are smaller than two single family homes. Um, so average new single family home is a couple years old, is about 2,500 square feet. I don't have great figures for duplex, but just anecdotally, it's actually about that same number. So two family homes create smaller units and so create more affordability. And affordability is the part that's really lacking. They um, unlocking opportunities, the city's fair housing assessment. One of the things it really stressed is the way structural racism works, the way legacy uh, racism works is not having enough affordable housing. So we're not necessarily saying we're trying to deliberately create housing for populations of color. We're just saying we're trying to create a more diverse housing stock in the process. So that's the one, that's the one that's the furthest along. Um, we have forms coming up in November, public meetings we just sent out earlier today for both downtown Florence and downtown Northampton to look at opportunities for denser housing in those areas. Um, so the commercial districts of Florence and downtown have always allowed incredibly dense housing. Um, we're not actually trying to increase the number of units, but they've always required the first floor be residential. In Florence, the dark purple on this, which is the Chestnut Street Main Street, and then the Maple North Maple Main Street, those dark purples we're suggesting keeping first floor have to be commercial because you want them to be vibrant. You want places where people will walk by. But the area in between, which is less dense, has more vacant land, that might be an opportunity to say, you know, you could build commercial there if you want it, but if you want the first floor to be residential, you could. It would both help Florence by having more people live within walking distance. It would, um, it's actually, as we think about COVID, as we think about less demand for retail, it allows property owners more options for how they invest. 
And again, it creates more housing opportunities at, at all levels of the market. Um, downtown's the same thing, slightly different. In this case, it's the opposite of Florence. Florence is the center. We're saying there's not commercial, it's sort of bimodal. Downtown is basically the, the red brick core of the city, it's in yellow. That we think should continue to be the first floor, has to be commercial. It's the red areas beyond that that could be housing. So at council has already been involved in this five years ago. Every building downtown had to be commercial on the first floor. City Council and two separate zoning ordinances changed that to say the facade of the building facing the street has to be commercial, but the, the first floor doesn't. So the best example is the lumber yard and 155 Live, where five years ago, the first floor of both those buildings would have been commercial. Neither building could have happened. There's not enough commercial demand for all of the Lumber Yard or 155 Live to be commercial. We relaxed that and said, we want the facade facing the street. So the frontage on Holyoke Street and on Pleasant Street had to be commercial, but the housing behind it could be, but the, the building behind it could be residential. Um, that's been a great success. And so that's why we're suggesting this next level. Again, given these two success stories from that zoning change you all made four or five years ago, we expect more success stories like that. So we wouldn't want Main Street to house on the first floor and create dead areas. But you can imagine some of these red areas. If Con Street had some dense housing that would add to downtown, more people living there, more people spending money, right? There's economic development as, long as, as well as housing. That would be fine. So the first one, the two families, is very far along. We're ready to introduce. We've already had a public forum. The next two, we've just announced our public forums. We hope to introduce to council formally sometime in the new year, um, maybe mid new year, we're not quite sure. The next one, we're in earlier stages, we're more conceptual. So 42 years ago, the state passed a Mass General Law Chapter 40B. And 40B said, we don't think there's enough affordable housing in the state, and we are going to give zoning boards the right to waive any and all local regulations. We're not just talking about zoning, sewer hookup fees, local wetlands regulations to the extent they're stricter than state wetlands regulations. Anything city council passes, the zoning board can waive in the interest of creating affordable housing. If you have less than 10% of your community's affordable housing, the way the state matches it, and the zoning board turns you down, you can appeal it to the Housing Appeals Board, which is deliberately set up to basically approve affordable housing. If you have over 10%, Northampton's about 12.5%, then the zoning board has the final say, other than normal violations going to court. So that means that we can waive any and all local regulations, but we are under no obligation to do it. But in order to do this, before you can ever apply for a comprehensive permit, you have to go to the state, you have to pay the state a couple thousand dollars to apply, you have to do advanced architectural work, and only then can you come back to the zoning board. We're basically saying, let's take exactly what the state law says. Let's only make it apply to zoning because we think other regulations do make sense. Um, and you can get out of the state process. So in essence, it would be a 40B locally. One could always go through the state process if they wanted to, but we're trying to sweeten our process enough that we don't, that most developers wouldn't do it. Um, this could be very small scale. For the most part, our zoning is dense enough the people don't do this. So the Lumber Yard and 155 Live and North Commons, the state hospital, they were all developed within our existing zoning. But the city councilors know that we recently acquired a piece of land for tax title on Woodland Drive. Um, we're going to do one market rate lot and one affordable lot. But we need to get a comprehensive permit for that because the depth of the lot isn't enough. So we're going to spend a couple thousand dollars of taxpayer money to go through the state process and delay it by three or four months. And so we want to think about, well, let's bring, let's have local control for this. Um, and, and then the next one, I don't have anything. This is, so if that last one is something we want to do, we're not quite ready. This next one is really just the concept phase. Um, and I think Alan's on the call. So Alan can even talk about how legal this is. We have done no research whatsoever, but the housing partnership was brainstorming and they brought to our attention that Somerville um, is putting, uh, just requiring notification. If you're gonna evict a tenant, 
for non-payment of rent, or if you're going to foreclose on a mortgage for non-payment of mortgage, um, Somerville is just requiring you to notify them what are all the measures out there? What are the things that people can help them with? Um, you know, we looked into a pro we have a program at Block Grant right now to help pay housing arrears for both mortgages and uh, utilities as part of the, our COVID relief that's frankly undersubscribed. We're not getting as many people as we wanted. Um, it would be great if, and partly it's because there was the moratorium, eviction moratorium until two weeks ago. But it would be nice if when the landlord started giving notice, they had to say, here's a program. It might or may not make a difference. Again, we have done no research on sort of looking at it. Um, and then the final thing, this is the part of saying isn't zoning at all. The last one wasn't zoning either. Um, but this goes back to that issue of cultural equity. And you all heard this, so this is nothing new, but you know, the debate all summer has been a lot more people are swimming on, the, on our swimming holes. We have five separate swimming holes um, that have, all five of them have had problems over the summer with noise and trash and diapers. And um, it's been this classic, almost sort of definition of what is institutional racism, right? Some people say, hey, we're not concerned because people who are swimming are brown, so therefore it's not institutional racism. We wouldn't like dirty diapers from anybody whatsoever, so therefore it's not institutional racism. And others are saying, hey, if we issued a ticket, 90% of the people issuing tickets are brown or black, that has to mean something. And if we're ignoring the fact that have people who live in public housing projects who can't have um, outdoor barbecues, how they have to recreate, um, then that needs to come into play. So again, right now my office is dealing with this just from a recreation standpoint. And so I don't even know what ordinances we're talking about, but we're just putting in the back of our mind thinking as we solve the swimming issues, we need to think about these issues as well. And I think that, yeah, that's all I have. And sorry if that was longer than you wanted me to do. But. Thank you, Mr. Fiden. We ask questions? Members? Jeff? Um, thank you uh, for that. That was great. Um, I just actually, I hadn't heard of the housing stability ordinance. And so I just Googled it as you mentioned it. Um, and um, I just found out that apparently two weeks ago in Boston, they just filed, the mayor just filed this um, act as well in Boston. Um, and it definitely, it's, one of the organizations that I work uh, have worked with for a while is um, the Springfield No One Leaves, which helps people with their who are facing eviction and foreclosure. And one of the crazy things that I have um, discovered time and time again is that people are often just like uh, bullied out of their homes um, without because they have no real sense of what what they can do. And I've actually spent lots of time canvassing handing out pamphlets to explain to people like just because you get a threatening letter from your landlord doesn't mean that you you um you have to leave immediately and so um i think that's actually a great thing i didn't know that this was um something that was uh, passed in somerville and it's i think it definitely sounds great um i have a question um just in terms of terminology because i know some of this stuff i don't know uh, uh, others um when you say um, when it's a, a two family by right, what does that mean? So there, there, it would basically be a cookbook. You, know, you still have to meet certain setback requirements, but by right means you don't have to put your hat in hand and ask for permission. So you have to meet the measurements. Your house has to be set back from the property boundary. It has to meet fire code, but it's not a discretionary permit. We have some permits where you can go to the zoning board or go to the planning board and say, can I do this? and they do an evaluation. Um, I see, okay, thank you. Um, I believe Megan was before Councillor Nash. Megan? And no, I didn't have a question. Okay, Councillor Nash. All right, thank you. So, um, so Wayne, thank you for that. That was that was uh, very helpful, and I'm I'm looking forward to us all having a chance to weigh in on the two family everywhere. I I, I think it's a great idea. Um, so with with that in mind, are there other things that you're thinking as our 
um, our expert on our zoning, um, what else do you see that we, we might want to take a bite at? Um, you know, there is a, there's a hot debate in the community about, you know, from a sustainability standpoint. So this is not about affordable housing, but from a sustainability standpoint, housing within walking distance of downtown is one of the most effective ways to reduce our carbon footprint, our, our, our ecological footprint. We know that in Northampton, about 40% of our carbon footprint is from people driving. So for a long, and, and we also know that when you get in your car, you might go to any store in any restaurant anywhere. When you walk, you're more likely to go to stores and restaurants than walking distance. So it's one of the, the best ways to support our downtown. But we also know that we went to city council, I don't know, six years ago, five years ago, for a dramatic increase in density. Jim was involved with the, the housing committee at the time. And we still get people who are very unhappy about that. So I don't think we're looking at any other densifications right now. Um, we know that limits to de development make housing more expensive. Um, and I, so I, we don't ignore that whenever we think about affordability of housing, it comes up in the process. But we also, you know, we're democracy and people don't want to be pushed too far in that process. Um, the two family by home, discussion is we're trying to separate, and actually the, the Florence and downtown as well, we're trying to separate people's perception of problems from the reality of problems. So for two family homes, for example, we're thinking about where do people park relative to the home? So you know, having four cars in the front yard stands out to the neighbors. Um, having a blank wall with no windows stands out and doesn't necessarily fit in. So we're trying to think about those kinds of things. Um, so how do we be, get better design so that it's not, so that people don't mind the new neighbors going on. As we do that, I guess, this is a long, long non-answer to him, but as we do that, then we come back and say, are there other things that people are okay with, right? So State Hospital, for example, has no cap on density. Um, there, there's, you know, pure height, but th you could fill far more density than the market wants than developers want in the process. Um, and yet includes both the most affordable housing in the city, the most affordable new housing in the city, and some of the most expensive housing. So are there more models like that? I mean, if we had this conversation 10 years ago before the Iraq war, some of us were predicting the VA would close at some point, and we thought about would that be our next Village Hill type project. That's clearly not happening, but I think we keep watching those opportunities. So in terms of specifically around zoning, it's, we're really just looking at um, what's coming down the pike is, is the expanding two family to everywhere in the city. There's some smaller things, but they're really not very big. So um, we hired actually a, um, a New York State and Los Angeles um, real estate investment firm, I don't know, four or five years ago now, um, to say, we do want to get more housing close to downtown. Why is it the market isn't doing it? The market's allowed to do more housing than, than we're actually getting. And so we asked them, among other things, to look at our zoning to say, what are the things that are stopping developers from happening? Um, and the only one they identified, other than we've already talked about, was um, very small subdivisions. Um, so right now, if you're, if you're expanding a road by a foot, that's a subdivision, and you, you're dividing land up, and to divide land up, and you expand the road by a foot, that's a subdivision. Should we have two different standards, one for very small projects, someone who's, who's doing a little bit of expansion, and some for large, larger projects? So we're going to look at that as well, but that's the only other thing that showed up in that assessment where you asked for the private sector to tell us what was working and what wasn't working. So one other question, and um, you mentioned the um, the commercial on the first floor. So it, have we waived that in certain circumstances within central business, or so, is it still required? Or so um, again, we we changed the zoning. You all changed the zoning a few years ago, first to allow buildings that were nowhere close to a street. So for example, along the roundhouse parking lot that you could do commercial, you could do residential on the first floor, and then buildings that didn't face a street. So the rear of a building behind. 
we've never waived it. There is some grandfathering. So there are some buildings that had residents. So there's an SRO on Pleasant Street that we use block grant money to help convert, to help get investment. And when they added commercial on the first floor, we allow them to keep some residential on the back. But no, we haven't waived it per se in parts. I, I should add, I know this isn't your value in that. Was that? Do you see any value in that? Because if somebody's going to build looking in the city core and they, they might be worried about, oh, I got to put that commercial on the first floor and renting commercial right now is really, that retail portion is really difficult. Would that be worth exploring? Yeah, so that's, that's exactly what that second slide is for downtown. We don't think we should get rid of commercial in the brick core buildings because that's really important. Yeah, you, you, what you don't want is a dead spot in core. If you go to a, even a mall, the second a mall loses a tenant, the first thing they do is they put a pop up there. Um, because as soon as you have an empty spot, people stop walking by it. So it's really important the commercial core not to have residential on the first floor because it creates this dead fabric. But yes, for half a downtown, we think that makes perfect sense. So away from that, that basically brick core, yes, allowing residential on the first floor makes perfect sense. It's inside, it's not only about allowing residential, but one of the reasons it has a, a huge value for a developer is if you have to provide wheelchair accessible access in a multi-story building and you can't do residential on the first floor, you have to put an elevator in. If you can do commercial residential on the first floor, you can have your wheelchair accessible units on the first floor and then have a staircase. So it's val it adds value beyond just an, not having to do commercial. All right, I could keep going, but I'm going to stop. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> Any other members? Council DeBarge, I can't see you on my screen, but. Um, Wayne, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to do a couple and I'll give you a call tomorrow. But I'm, I'm very concerned here. Two families by right in single family zones. Is it Ward 6? Also single family zone? Yes, so it would definitely include Ward 6. Again, Ward 6 has some two families because of the clusters, but yeah, it would definitely allow two families. Now, what we're doing is we've already, just some quick history so you know, 32 years ago, the city allowed accessory apartments of up to 800 square feet everywhere in the city, including Ward 6. It was so successful and so few complaints that, and don't forgive me on my calendar, I'm not gonna get this exactly right, but about 25 years ago, we went from being a special permit, which is you have to ask, to allowing it by right. That was so successful about 20 years ago, we went from 800 square feet to 900 square feet. So every single home in the entire city for 32 years has been allowed to carve off 900 square feet. And we've had very little problems with that. So this is sort of the next logical step in doing it. I know, Wayne, when I went to you, oh, how many years ago? Six, seven, eight years ago, nine years ago, in regards to many families who parents wanted to come to live with them. And um, our former building inspector, Tony Patillo and I had sat down with you in regards of designing an ordinance um, in regards of in-laws apartments being attached to houses. And we've done fantastic with that ordinance. I mean, Ryan Road over on Autumn Drive that was done. I mean, people really thought that was amazing to have that ordinance to have their in-laws come and live with them. So my concern was when I see two families by right in single family zones, was can this actually happen in Ward 6, Ward 7, Ward 5, correct? So mostly right. all the wards would be affected by this. That's correct. And, and remember- uh, you know, with the frontage, How about the frontage and the setbacks? What would the frontage be? Frontage wouldn't change. Okay. Lot size wouldn't change, but you would still need the same setbacks. So whatever the house is required to be now, would still be required for the expansion. So basically, if I have a single family home and I could expand that house, or if I have a set single family home and I could allow an accessory apartment, then it could be two family. But it wouldn't give you a new square foot of, you couldn't develop if you couldn't develop today. It's just how you use it. Okay, and, so when you're saying two family, 
I mean, you're talking about adding on another addition and you can rent it? Yeah, and, and you can do that today. The, the accessory apartments, which you said the mother-in-law, there's no requirement that be to a relative. So if you have okay. an accessory apartment today, you can rent it. Okay. The, the biggest, yeah, the, the, the two biggest differences are today you're limited to 900 square feet. If you wanted that second unit to be 1,400 square feet, you could. The other difference is one of the two units has to be owner occupied, either the house or the accessory dwelling unit. If it's two family, it wouldn't have to be. You could live there if you chose to, but if you decide to move to Florida and then rent both units, you could still do that. So uh, another thing I'd like to talk about is like on Woodland, where we're looking at affordable housing, we could put two families in there, correct? Two family homes? Instead of not yeah, just so leaving it. We could agree with the neighborhood. So they can always do additional deed restrictions. So our agreeing with the neighborhood is in return for their supporting the units in a lot they didn't think was developed, we're only planning to develop two units the entire property, market rate and affordable. And that will probably include a deed restriction because that's, that's the arrangement we made with them. So, and a developer can always do that. Sometimes people do it. I'll sell my lot to you in return for your agreeing on whatever you agree to. So that would remain. Because you know who I am. I call you all the time, even though there's engineers in my family. I like talking to you about knowing about the zoning and so forth. But um, some of it I need to talk to you about. But I, I'm really excited about this ordinance, Wayne, in Somerville. And I think the city councilors should look at this very, very carefully because I think we're opening the door to a good resolution here. That's it for now. I'll call you tomorrow. Okay. Um, Megan, did you have anything you wanted to? Yeah. I, I agree with um, Council Labarge and that the Housing Stability Act is something that should probably eventually be one of our recommendations. Right. Um, and um, I'm, I'm sorry, just circle back to something I think Councillor um, Nash was asking earlier and put a little finer point on it. Are you saying, Mr. Fiden, that um, the, that increasing, increasing the supply of housing should, should bring down rent prices or, or Conversely, scarcity of housing raises prices. Um, but I that would that is that's assuming like there's a level of demand. But I think they're actually we're in an area that is actually experiencing increased demand. And from and I'm just I you know our it's part of our charge of our commission to to really view what we're doing look at these ordinances through a sort of social justice lens and we have to be concerned about how they're affecting the marginalized you know low-income populations in our in our town and um how would how would you um how would this housing this new ending of this new housing be be affordable and um, accessible other than just being downtown yeah it's such a really good question i mean the reality is just maybe more details than you want. Let me just sort of do two things quickly. One is in some very large, highly desirable urban areas, you can get a significant amount of what's called cross subsidies. In return for letting you build a market rate unit, you can subsidize an affordable unit. Boston can do that, San Francisco can do that, lots of cities can do it. Our rates are marginal enough here that we're not going to get a significant amount of cross subsidies. Right? You might get some if you're building a you know a half million dollar home, and if Massachusetts allowed us to do impact fees, you could probably do some you know ten thousand dollar impact fee for affordable housing. But the sort of thing you get in New York, where if you're building ten high end units, we want you to build three market rate units. There's not enough profit in those units to do cross subsidies. So the reality is what we jokingly call big A affordability. You know, affordability for units that are subsidized and are selling for selling or renting for below 80% of area median income. Those are gonna rely heavily on subsidies. We do a lot right now, you know, the, the mayor has agreed that most of our MassWorks applications 
huge amounts of our um, CDBG app money um, with council approval and CPA approval, huge amounts of our CPA dollars are going for affordable housing. But ultimately, we're not going to get a lot of affordable housing without those deep subsidies. So whereas, again, in Boston, zoning could create big A affordability, I think the reality is what we're heavily focused on is creating more units than at 80 to 120% of area median income, lowering the, the price of affordability. So if single family homes are coming in at half a million, $600,000, can we create more opportunities for smaller duplexes that are not gonna be affordable for someone earning 60% of their income, but are gonna be that, that in between. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the reality for us. We may get some, you know, we just closed on, we sold four building lots on Burt's Pit Road last week to a developer who's doing affordable units. Mm -hmm. And it is the first market rate developer in the city who's doing affordable units without deep substance. In it. But you know, that says something where 12.5% of our housing affordability and these are the first um, actually six, uh, six units that aren't getting deep subsidies. Thank you. Councillor Nash. Yeah, I, so I think you may have answered with that long question, with that long answer there, Wayne, but um, are there any, I mean, so uh, in terms of the, the newer projects going on, unless they're subsidized, they aren't affordable, or at least it, affordable in a sense of, well, the, the construction going on generally are, in Ward 3 near to downtown in, you know, um, on Pleasant Street, tends to be uh, studios, one to two bedrooms, um, that, um, that uh, lots of condominiums, um, that uh, in the 400 or more range 100. in general, and that, that I, I, I don't consider that, you know, and, and, and the people moving in, tend not to be uh, what we would say are, are people looking for affordable housing. Right. So is there a way, is there a way out of that? You know, so I, I do know like what's happened at Love, Live 155, you know, where there's market rate in combination with, with, uh, with subsidized and it's a really great mix. And, um, is there more ways we could go and and come up with a way to support that kind of um, mix in, in housing so that we avoid this this one to two one to two bedroom gentrification going on? Yeah. So um, new construction is really expensive, um, and so things like Live One Fifty Five, where there are are some. Uh, workforce housing at the North Commons, uh, 140 Orlando Drive, that's under construction now. Those are both possible because of, of financial subsidies, right? We're putting $550,000, or so could be not quite that much, $400,000 into North Commons, and they got, you know, multi-million dollars of state and federal funds. So, no, I don't think you can do the live 155 without deep subsidies in our market. We had some, you know, the, the columns at State Hospital at Village Hill, those are coming at the very high 200s, low 300s, still not affordable, not being affordable by any means, but lower cost. Those accessory apartments, the small units, the, you know, someone carves out a thousand square feet and adds their units. Some of those are more in that workforce housing range. But, you know, if, if you're getting a big condo project with new construction, it's not really going to, you know, maybe less expensive than a single family home. Um, but it's not really going to be in that, that lower range out there. And so that's, that's why the two family and that's why the downtown Florence are the ones we're leading with, because those are likely to be the absolute smallest units um, that have the greatest capacity for doing that. The big condo projects, this has not been our big, I mean, condos are great. I mean, you know, if, you know, I live in a home I raised a daughter in, she's gone, I could downsize. I'm not going to, but I could downsize. You know, so creating, those sort of housing opportunities are always good to have in smaller units, but the condo projects are going to be exactly what you said, Jim, and not going to really lower the price dramatically. Thank you. 
Can I say one more thing? I, I'm not sure this is what Megan was beginning to get up. I just want to address this. So I, I've done some projects in Northern California, um, in Healdsburg and, and Sebastopol, um, where it is clear that they can never build their way out of the housing crisis. Because no matter how many housing units they build, there's unlimited demand coming from San Francisco and the Silicon Valley. Um, it's also true that if you were in Bismarck, North Dakota, you could easily build your way out of a housing crisis. Um, we, the reality is we're closer to Bismarck than we are to um, San Francisco. I mean, our demand is not um, inelastic, right? So the more units, the, the more some people move to town, but our demand is pretty close to inelastic. That is, there's a limited demand in building helps us meet that demand. So we don't have that sort of West Coast phenomenon of, an, of a limited demand. Councilor Labarge. Um, Wayne, how much are, what is the price of the condos in Ward 3 where the Shaw's Motel was? I don't know the answer. Hi. Do you, you, how much, do you know Councilor Nash? What are those priced at? I, I have heard from some people that they're uh, 400 plus for one, for one to two bedroom. It, it's, it's and you got nice some right over by the police state. Neighborhood, but it's, it's not uh, typically a, um, a starter home or a oh, starter no. home for somebody. Same over down by the police station. They're running 800,000. I think it's people who have money and at that point it's the location and they can connect right on to 91 if they have to go to work or whatever. That's what I feel at St. Mary Cemetery. You look at that also, those condos right on the main drag, which would bring them right into 91. So, I mean, I am into affordable housing 100% and I look at the prices of what these condos are going I mean, they're unbelievable. Agreed. So I can see where many families with children have to make a decision where they cannot build here in Northampton or either even afford an apartment. So we got to do something. We need to put our heads together. And I think you're going in the right direction on this one. I have concerns here on downtown at first floor residential, not in commercial. Looking at the mapping, what is the red and what is the yellow? Because I couldn't hear that. So I'm just go back on my slide. So the yellow is the area we're basically suggesting no change in housing on the first floor. That's the area where a break in the pedestrian path would really harm businesses. You'd have a, a dead spot in the urban fabric is the jargon, but you know, it would stop people from walking. Those are the areas that that life is really suffers so we don't get people walking. Um, the areas between the yellow and the red is the area we're proposing, saying that's okay to have housing on the first floor. Okay, all right. And again, in both, to be clear, in both the yellow and the red today, you can do housing set back from the street. So even in the yellow, you know, if um, any business on Main Street today wanted to carve off the first 60 feet in the store and then do a unit behind, they can already do that. And we're not talking about getting rid of that. We're just talking about the facade that faces the street. So the only change is what do you see from the sidewalk? Okay, also to the Florence Center at first floor residential, not in commercial core. I can't even figure out these names on this map. Oh, sorry, okay. They're like blurry. Um, so I don't know what is what here. So basically, I guess the way to think about it is in the main intersections where there's lots of stuff going on. You know, Maple in Maine and Chestnut in Maine, those are the areas, again, we're suggesting no change. The areas in between, which, you know, I hope friendly stays, but if friendly is closes, or if the building, you know, the, the parking lot behind Friendly's was available, um, or the parking lot to the left, those are the places that we're talking about someone could do uh, residential on the first floor. If, if Florence Bank ever decided they didn't need such a big parking lot and wanted to carve that out. Um, okay. The dentist has been looking at the, the uh, Dr. Falk has been looking at his rear building and saying, 
he's never getting a commercial there. Could we allow residential in that rear building? It's that kind of use. Dr. Right, Fultz so and I know who's actively looking at it. So. so if you say at first floor residential, not in commercial core, I mean, if somebody adds a residential first floor, I mean, they also, wouldn't they have to do handicapped accessible? No, or yes, just put up a residential area, that's it, not handicapped accessible? Yeah, they, have to, they have to meet the same standards as everybody else. For, for I'm not sure what the thresholds are, but you know, certainly rental housing, yes, not you know, other things. But yeah. Okay, thank you, Wayne. Councilor Nash. All right, I'm sorry, I keep coming up with more questions. All right, around the housing stability ordinance that you were um, uh, uh, pointing our way here, Wayne. So you're saying this is basically hot off the press, they're doing it in other places, and here you go. <laughs> <laughs> is there is there more consultate is there more you know information support that uh the the planning department could provide for us around as we consider i mean could we because it it's not i i would think that it's not something we just want to go and grab somerville's and wow. sign it in and uh but that we we could come up with some sort of process to um you know maybe uh maybe have it come to council later in the year next year with some sort of discussion. Yes, we, we can certainly do research and, and work with Alan Seawall to make sure that we're not suggesting something that's not legal. Again, we haven't had any conversations with Alan yet. Yeah, let's not do anything. We're happy to do that. <laughs> Dr. Napolitano. Yeah, I'm just um, curious, just because a lot of this stuff I'm not familiar with, and I'm wondering if you have any recommendations just on how um, I might get educated on sort of the basics about affordable housing, uh, just basic housing stuff, because a lot of the things that um, Councillor Labarge and you were talking about back and forth, I don't quite understand all of the, the different aspects of it. Is there a way that I can sort of get caught up to speed that you would recommend? Um, well, I'm certainly happy to talk to you anytime. Let me think about it if, it, if, it have, if I have any good publications to send you, but I'm okay. certainly happy to talk to you if I can't find something. I'll make a okay. note anyway and think about that. Megan. Hi, to answer um, Member Napolitano, I too am I'm a complete neophyte here um, and a lot of the jargon goes over my head, but um, I thought a good primer was that Unlocking Opportunities report that was produced in 2019. I think there was a link to it. Um, Laura sent it to us, maybe on one of the agendas, and um, it's specific to Northampton. Um, so. And I also want to say um, I happened to sit in on the meeting um, right before this one with the Northampton Housing Partnership. And um, that's where I, because I saw their agenda has some overlaps with us there. Um, and I think they're, they're definitely a lot more um, further along this than we are. Um, they don't have the same charge, of course, but I would say, you know, talking to someone in the housing partnership would be helpful or having, maybe having them come and talk to us one of our future meetings. There. Thank you, Megan. There. Mm -hmm. Nope, did you have something else? I didn't want to cut you off. Looked like you were done. I think Councillor Nash had his hand up before. I know, I, I just okay. want to say, Megan, I didn't know if Megan had, I didn't want to oh. cut, cut Megan off. If you had something else further to say, Megan. Um, no, that's all right. I'll come Thanks. back to it later. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Councillor Nash and then Councillor Labarge. Uh, Member Peck, I think that's a great idea. Invi inviting the housing partnership. I see Patrick's already in the room, but I'm um, actually <laughs> inviting them to our meeting. Um, they, they may have, um, you know, ideas ready to go that uh, might be helpful. And um, so I, that's a terrific idea. So that's another good idea for the next agenda. <laughs> Perfect. Councilor Labarge. Yes, and I want to echo what Councilor Nash is saying because I feel the same way about that. Okay. Anyone else? Any other members? Okay. Mr. Fighten. Um, a developer comes in and wants to build a two-family home by right, could they convert that 
to a condominium if they so choose? Oh, yes, they could. Yes, we don't regulate, we don't have the legal right to regulate ownership. So okay. we regulate use, but not ownership. Okay. So you couldn't regulate the developer um, or making them require, they have visibility features, somewhat like 155 Live has some visibility features. You couldn't do that with those developers who come in and want to build a two family home by right, correct? We can do anything in terms of no, in terms of the visibility features. We can. You that's can. Part okay. Of the yeah, okay. it's the ownership aspect we couldn't. So even a um, accessory apartment today, somebody could condominiumize it. Um, it's not a huge market because people are petrified of living in condexes. Right. You could fight with your neighbor, but it's perfectly legal, and some people do it. Okay. But yeah, so all those design pieces, that, that's part of the ordinance we're working on. Is how do we make it? You know. Because we look at the legit in, in that part of the city where two families are by right, you know, there's no question. Some people build ugly boxes with no windows. And so we are trying to think how do we separate the legitimate complaints we get from neighborhoods okay. from an opposition to development general. And maybe I missed it earlier. So I know the uh, urban residential C and B, 60% of our population is there. Urban residential A, what does that consist of? It's the next ring around. U URA is the biz most bizarre district in the city. Like every other <laughs> district makes sense. It's sort of left over. Um, some of it were areas, frankly, that really fought being URB. I mean, you know, Councillor Nash asked me what are other steps we could do. Over the years, frankly, we have suggested getting rid of URA. A few are in suburban areas, which are close to water supplies that should be down zoned and most are surrounded by URB and URC. And frankly, other than the very strong opposition, they make no sense. Ward Avenue, parts of Round Hill. Um, we had a proposal to rezone them, I don't know, a decade ago and ran away with our tail between our legs. Um, and we wouldn't get that many units. This goes back to the amount of affordability. I, I'm not sure it's that important because I'm not sure you get that many units out of it. But from a practical standpoint, there's no reason that it shouldn't be URB in almost every case. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Councilor Council LaBarge is before me. Councilor LaBarge. You had your hand up before me. Um, thank you, Councilor. Um, now I lost my train of thought here. I still got my question. I know, I had mine and it was a good one too. <laughs> okay, this is the one. The local comprehensive permit ordinance way. Ability to waive local regulations. I know on South Street there was a problem about what went on by changing the regulations there. So what are we talking about? Ability to waive local regulations for subsidizing homes or what? I don't, I don't get this. That's right. So under state law, 33% of the units have to be affordable. So if you're proposing a project in which 33% of the units are affordable to someone earning 80% of carry median income or below, you could apply today for a comprehensive permit and the zoning board could waive any local zoning regulations. As long as it's affordable? As long as it's affordable, as long as 33% of the units are affordable. Okay. But in order to apply to the zoning board, and then the zoning board has a lot of authority, you need what's called a site eligibility le letter from the State Department of Housing and Community Development. And that's the bureaucracy we're trying to get rid of. We're trying to say, we don't want to make you go through that extra step you got to remember that the history 42 years ago is many cities and towns were not doing well. They were discouraging affordable housing. So the state came in and saying, we're going to overrule local government. And that may be still be needed in many towns. But I don't think it's needed in cities that want more affordable housing like ours. So this would basically be, let's get local control back from the state. Okay. All right. Well, what about... All right, say somebody has property, their grandfathered in, right? All of a sudden, because 
you want to make these changes so there's affordability for people to be able to have a home and so forth like that. Does grandfathering still stay in place? Um, yes, it wouldn't change. Has a piece of land or their house, everything is grandfathered. Yes, I, it wouldn't change that. I just, I need to note, just given this committee's charge, that the Supreme Judicial Court has determined that they're never going to use the word grandfather again because it has uh, a history of slavery and how they disenfranchise African Americans. Okay. So we've stayed away from that. I mean, that's, you know, that's new. But yes, as a practical matter, it would not change whatever pre existing nonconformities somebody has will remain pre existing nonconformities. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Councillor Nash. All right, first, a quick question. What do we use instead of the G word? Well, pre-existing non-conforming is that's that's the legal term. Non-conforming. Oh my God! All right, we got it. better than that. <laughs> All right. And it's, um, just, so, you know, it's just a footnote that they made. It wasn't a decision. It yeah. What, what, um, so the bigger question had to do with first: Is our rental market shrinking? Because that's my sense that it is shrinking, Absolutely. and that what can we do? to help uh, sustain our rental market because what's it, we more and more units are turning into condos or short-term rentals or that and we're losing that that rental housing stock and i think that's part of the reason that the that the rental rates are so high your thoughts on that so you're absolutely right this is this is long I mean, it's not a dramatic decline so i've been here 32 years when I got here, we were about 51% home ownership, 49% rental. We're right. now about 45% rental, 55% ownership. So it's been shrinking, not a dramatic shrink, but it's pretty significant. Um, you're absolutely right with the condominiumization, although actually the bigger piece has been the loss of units. People with a two family home who've gone to one family. So that's probably been a, a more significant loss in units than the condominium piece. Um, uh, so, again, for me, it's about allowing the multifamily for all levels. And we're talking about very high end units as well as low end. I mean, some of the units that were condominiumized were very high end, old school commons, went condo. Those were not affordable units, but they became even less affordable. Um, uh, it's certainly thinking, I mean, I, I guess I keep coming back to your question. I guess it didn't totally answer correctly because I keep thinking new things of other zoning things. We still measure the total lot yield you get, the number of units you're allowed to do across the city by, by how many dwelling units you're allowed to create. If I'm only allowed to create one dwelling unit, there's an incentive for me to make it a bigger unit that's gonna be a more expensive unit. One could argue that a totally different way to look at things, which would be a totally different way, is let's talk about how many square feet you're allowed in your unit on a piece of property. Mm -hmm. So it's lot yield is number of units per acre. Instead of number of units per acre, it's number of square feet per acre. And that would then take away the, the, incentive, the major financial incentive to build large single family homes, you might say, well, I could make more money by doing three small units, four tiny units. Um, it, it would get, it would be very controversial, which is why we haven't gone there, because the reality is smaller units um, have fewer cars per unit, but collectively they have more cars. So a duplex has fewer cars than two single families, but it has more cars than, you know, the same house as a single family. And then that's the other area you get pushed back. So we'd have to think about it carefully of a lot of conversations. But if we were sort of crystal ball on where we might go someday, that's a logical place. Um, and this, this is all a long answer to your question of the smaller units with the market wants to rent. There is a rental market for three and four bedrooms, but it's relatively small. Megan? Um, Councillor Nash, a, a quick Google search turned up the a term legacy as a less racially charged, more inclusive term for grandfathered. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. I hadn't heard that. <coughs> I like the like lawyer's advice. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up, Wayne, because that was in the Boston Globe a little over a month ago about that, that case. Uh, I believe it was Land Court. It was, yeah. Any, anyone else? Jeff, you're all set? Okay. Yep, um, the, um, Megan directed me to uh, the document that I had overlooked in my email, uh, which I definitely has a lot to go through. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Councilor Nash. I'm good. Councilor Labarge. You're good. Yep. Well, Mr. Fighting, thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you for having me. Thanks for all, all right. your work. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you, Wayne. Take care of yourself. Thank you. I see next on the agenda, which shouldn't be on there, the time frame and possibility of extension or continuance, which shouldn't be on there. So I'm going to table that and ask that that go on in a future um, um, meeting. So the last thing we have is to adjourn. Make that motion to adjourn. Can I ask one question before we do? Go right ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, is there, uh, I just want to make sure that um, if we do need to consider that we might need to go beyond or request a dispensation to go beyond um, the end of December, is there a time frame by which we have to make that request? It should be done pretty soon. And I, was, I, I wanted to have this meeting done first and then see if anyone came up with some ideas, but it has to go before the council. So I'm gonna say uh, oh, okay. sometime, yes. So sometime like before the end of the month. Okay, got it. I like, I like the option of requesting extension and maybe not using all of that time. Is that possible? Attorney Seawall? I mean, like giving a, ourselves a time explain, cushion of sorts. I would ask. I would like to ask Attorney Seawall. Right. It, you don't have to use all the time that you have up to the deadline. You can submit your report whenever you think you're ready to submit the report. Uh, my experience in situations like this, it's that's not human nature to get an extension and not use it all. But uh, you, you're certainly can do that if that's the if that's what the committee desires we're we're finishing this meeting half an hour earlier than expected there you I go to believe it. <laughs> does that sound okay to you councilor labarge now i gotta think about it Can we put it on the agenda to dis discuss then? The, what would you like to have discussed? Just the continuation of oh, yeah. on <laughs> whether or not to request yeah, for the next meeting. extension. Yeah, we can put that on for the next. Oh yeah. All right. Okay, anyone else? Oh, Councilor Nash. Yeah, I, and um, on the next agenda, uh, discussing uh, recommendations, you know, I, I think we're, um, we, we just had all of that information shared with us by um, Mr. Fiden. So um, what do we want to do with it? I mean, so there's the two family, we know that's going forward. Mm -hmm. That's really kind of outside of our uh, charge right now, but we could throw it a recommendation. Uh, there's the housing stability ordinance. Um, Act that that. That. Okay. Um, so if we could have a discussion at our next meeting to just kind of like say, what do we want to do with these things exactly. that we discussed tonight? Just so we're clear, discussion on the presentation from tonight and a discussion on, so pretty much anything about the presentation, which includes the housing stability um, act that you mentioned, so that would be included because that was included in a packet. Would that yeah. suffice, or do you want it? Right, and, and including uh, the um, the material sent forward by um, 
Megan. Megan. Yes. Yep. Member Peck. Yep. Megan. How do we feel about inviting a member of the Northampton Housing Authority Housing Partnership um, to kind of provide a little more context on on these topics? Um, they also have a more of an advocate role that I think we share. Um, so I think it would be valuable to hear from, um, we could ask Reverend Weir or what's his name? Gordon, um, he's part of the, he, he's a, an attorney at the community legal aid, the attorney, I think. attorney, Megan. Gordon Shaw. Gordon Shaw. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. We will. Should we reach out to one of them? I think that's about them. And depending how the agenda is looking, um, exactly. I like to keep everything within a two hour time frame. Mm -hmm. We will go from there. So I think the first priority will be um, the housing authority as the speaker first, and then possibly looking at what Megan had suggested regarding um, uh, some affordability with housing. So that would like to have been on the two for the next agenda. So I just like to make sure the time frame for everything doesn't exceed and we just go all night just. So. Sure, I mean, I, I think depending on the their availability the availability yeah. of the speakers, but we could ask them to just join us for the first half hour then, yeah. so. Or the, or the last half hours, oh, yeah. depending on what. Councilor Nash? I, I'm good. I'm still trying to figure out what pre-existing non-conforming means. <laughs> oh. We went through this already. Legacied. Oh. Jim, I'll be That's doing this all night. It, yeah. I think we went through this already. Yes, but it doesn't conform. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second that. Motion made by Councillor Nash, seconded by Councillor DeBarge. Laura, can we get a roll call, please, on the motion to adjourn? Councillor LaBarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. That's it. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Great. Right. Thank you, everybody.